Hey, welcome back to the studio. Uh, today I've got a little bit of guidance for you on the Mixed Media Microcosmos assignment uh, and a couple of demos. So, um, hope you're all doing well. Let's get going. So, uh, this project, uh, I wanted to give you all the freedom to work with uh, mixed media, combining what we've learned so far as far as charcoal, graphite, uh, and uh, ink and wash and quill pen uh, with whatever other media that you might like. The uh, subject matter or concept uh, that I would like for you to entertain revolves around the idea that um, uh, the microcosmos or the microscopic world can be both uh, very, very beautiful uh, and uh, also, as we're finding out, incredibly deadly at the same time. Um, with, uh, with the COVID virus and all of that. Um, so I would like to um, give us the opportunity to use references from the microscopic world, like this uh, uh, pho photograph here. This is an electron microscope photograph of plankton. And no, I do not have ele an electron microscope. I uh, got this from a simple Google image search of microscope microscopic stuff. And so, um, your subject matter can include uh, whatever you would like. Some things are very beautiful. Here's a, someone's uh, image of a coronavirus itself. Look at that. That's just a, a gorgeous little thing. Um, or it can include things as far down uh, in scale as um, uh, atomic structures and uh, things like that, geologic features. Um, I went more organic. Uh, this here is um, some mm, electron microscope view of some fungus, some very, 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 very tiny mushrooms. Um, these are uh, actual pollen um, molecules or whatever they are, little, little bits of pollen. This has been an incredibly bad year for me. Uh, as far as allergies go, and so I wanted to include some pollen into the drawing that I'm preparing to do. Um, this is another take here on uh, the COVID virus. This is COVID uh, flowing through the bloodstream, I think. Um, this is a black and white version. And I, I printed out another bigger view of this, these plankton. And I included these because I, you know... I, I normally would be beginning to uh, prepare my season of fishing, and I'm not able to do that right now, so um, I'm going to include some fish-type stuff into, uh, into my artwork. Um, let's see. I've got a lot to show you here, so let me uh, skip over to some things that you might need uh, for this. Of course, you'll need... Uh, all of your, your regular drawing pencils. Um, I'm going to maybe include some chalk pastel and some watercolor. Definitely have done that. And um, I've got other things around, tracing paper and such, um, uh, India ink and brushes and all that. Um, let me hit, before I forget, the basics of the assignment. So this project uh, will be due April 4th. Um, a combination of at least, I want you to include at least graphite, charcoal, uh, ink and wash or quill pen, either way with the ink, and whatever other kinds of fun stuff that you want to throw in. You'll probably want to do this on watercolor paper, and I'll demonstrate here in a second how to handle some, some new ways uh, of handling that for you all. Um, I would like for you to create five thumbnails again, uh, studies. Uh, however you would like to approach uh, your work, um, and then create a final drawing, a finished drawing, that is around 16 by 20 inches. You could go bigger if you would like to, of course. Um, on high quality, and I put drawing paper there, um, should maybe want to go with the watercolor paper if you're going to do any washing. Um, I would like for you to upload 2D2L your finished drawing, of course, uh, an image of your thumbnails, just a, a JPEG of your thumbnails, and a picture of the source or sources that you uh, are working from. Now, 
Um, I'm going to create a whole new world where pollen somehow exists with the plankton and the coronavirus are all floating around in this space. But you could uh, simply choose one subject matter, a microscopic view of a bug or something like that, and uh, do a big drawing of that. So you just need one or more sources. I'm going to leave this pretty open uh, because I would like for you all to have some fun with it. Sorry about that view of this drawing board there. Let's see. I want, I want to show you what I spent yesterday doing and why um, this uh, is getting posted a little bit later as I had I, um, I taped down some watercolor paper. I'll show you how to do that in a second. I'm going to work backwards here. Um, and um, I uh, created a, a loose field of color and shape to uh, in, uh, embed my drawing in. And so let me give you a good view of, of, of this. I've got um, some bubble wrap um, and uh, some other things here. I'll, I'll start pulling them all up. So I've got this uh, speedball screen filler weighing down uh, some of these things, this old souffle cup. And you can see, as I begin to pull these off, how this is a combination of India ink and watercolor on there, and how that, that leaves that um, circle. The paper towel leaves this texture as I set it on there. I happen to have a bunch of wasps around my place and so I, I collected a bunch of wasp nests like that and then weighted that down and you can see how that's really uh, cool and beautiful how that uh, the water meteor reticulated. Reticulation is a word that refers to the uh, nature of water and in our case water media pulling up and around uh, the edges of things as it sets, the way that it dries. It's uh, a little bit different than that, but that's a good enough explanation for now. Um, more bubble wrap, and I wanted, aha, I wanted these circles from the bubble wrap, these sort of little natural circles here. Let's see, there's another circle. This is a, uh, a little form I cut out for a screen print project that I did a demonstration for a, a little while ago and you can see where that was laid down the water media uh, pulled up and laid out uh, against those edges and left a sort of a ghost of that. Um, some more texture from the uh, paper towel a few more of those circles. Let's see. Let me pull that up. It's like Christmas. Um, this is another stencil that I cut out. It's a plant, plant form stencil. And you can see it's sort of ghost there that um, is left. Oop. Another... Oh, that didn't leave too much. That's a little disappointing. Up, leaving that bit of a circle, some more of that, Oop. and that left some nice uh, hive looking stuff, and one last little stencil here that left that. So here is a view, sorry about the twisting nature of that, of the uh, paper that I have to work on. Maybe this will give you a better example. So what I'm going to do is introduce pollen, plankton, coronavirus stuff into this uh, composition. And I'll come back here in a second, show you how to stretch watercolor paper and to um, transfer a, tr a couple of different transfer techniques for the imagery. All right. Okay, so... Uh, taping watercolor paper down uh, is a good thing to do, especially if you're going to get uh, your paper to be really uh, wet and saturated like this. This be, uh, helps to be sh make sure that the paper dries flat. Um, I did this uh, wash, like I say, yesterday, and it is still a little wet um, because I had all of that plastic over it. It's going to take 
probably another couple of hours before it's fully dry, dry, draw on. So give yourself some time with this. Um, if you don't have all of this stuff, that's okay. You can approach your drawing with the materials at home that you have. Uh, but if you do, it's a, it's a very fun thing to do. Um, uh, traditional watercolorists will um, generally pre-soak their, their watercolor paper. They'll put it in a sink or maybe even a bathtub if it's a big sheet for um, uh, 10, 15 minutes and let that paper get super, super saturated. The paper expands. It's a cotton paper, so it expands. And then they'll tape it down instead of uh, with like this, uh, this is just two, blue, blue two-inch painter's tape that I got from Lowe's. Um, instead of using this stuff, they'll use a water-activated uh, gummed paper tape to tape their uh, watercolor paper down. So that's traditional and professional. This works, and I do this all the time, and I'm a professional, so... Um, this is a good way to do it too. I'm not pre-soaking this paper because then of course my tape wouldn't stick. But um, it's going to dry out nonetheless. And what I want to do uh, to ensure that this uh, tape stays adhered is give it a good, uh, I don't know, three quarters of an inch or half of the tape uh, down. And then uh, take that. It's a little crooked, but I, it's all right. I want to tape one side and then the other. Sometimes if my paper is big enough, if I tape one side and then the top or the bottom, I can get that paper twisted a little bit and end up with a, a sort of uh, pleat in it or wrinkle in it. don't want to do that. So this, uh, I'm simply going to tape down all four edges. Of this paper. And then maybe use the edge of a paintbrush to, to burnish this down. Make sure that it's adhering really well, especially along the edges when I do a wash. It will, uh, it, the water can get underneath there. Um, now I am going to. I uh, really quickly demonstrate just uh, putting some of this stuff down rather intuitively. Um, again, this is super fun. A couple of things that you want to think about, though, when you're doing this is in your whole drawing as you go along, um, it's easy to get, uh, it's easy for me to get really playful with these washes and make them uh, very active and bright. Um, not remembering that I'm going to introduce new images or forms on top of them. And so I have to, or I want to, um, remind myself to um, slow down a little bit and make this background, this is going to essentially be a background, more understated than, um, than I would let myself go with. Because I have to allow for these other things to be included in there and for them really to become dominant. If my background here is too bright or too active, it's going to conflict with the forms that I put into it or on top of it. And they'll have a dominant subordinate um, mismatch. So I want to be uh, real aware of that. Now, that being said, sometimes doing this and creating these, these grounds like this, maybe... Uh, in, in some more contemporary, abstract, non-objective worlds, this is art in and of itself. But for our purposes, we're going to be putting stuff on there, a thing or some things. And so I want to make what I do here uh, have the ability to be subordinate. So um, I am going to use uh, ink and wash and some watercolor and a couple of different tools for that and then uh, put some stuff out to create some textures with. Um, now you don't have to do this. Uh, you could uh, tone your paper or simply put a wash down and draw into that wash. Um, I just want to make this an option for you. Um, here I'm just using a sponge to saturate this paper with to get it wet so that the uh, water media uh, works and flows into the 
uh, in, into these spaces. I've got uh, yellow ochre here. Uh, this is um, burnt sienna here, a blue and a India ink black. And I just want to let these sort of flow out. Maybe I'll get a bigger brush. Yeah, here we go. And uh, let the water start to to pool around and, and smush around and let these colors... Uh, I want this one to... Uh, this one's awfully cool in temperature, color temperature. I want this one to be dominated by warm uh, temperature. Let me get some more water in here. Um, these are cheap watercolors, so they tend to break apart like that, which I actually kind of like. Now I'm going to throw some some blues in here and uh, lastly because it can be so dominant I'm going to put some black uh, India ink down or Sumi ink and then a little bit of that. Now that is very active. You can see my temperament is to just go with it and and so I'll have to deal with that later when I begin to draw into it. But, um, so while this is wet, in order to get things like that to happen, now while this is wet, I'm going to lay some textures and stuff back into it so uh, that um, so that those textures remain present. Um, and... This is some old screen that I have laying out in the garage. It's pretty fun. It will create sort of a screen, of course, grid-like texture. And I'm introducing these textures in groups of three, partially because I, I think that makes compositional sense. And uh, three different sizes, too. So I've got a big one, a medium one, and where should I put this one? Maybe right here, get some of that black to pull up and around. A small one. Oh, let's see what else I found out in my garage that would be fun or could be fun. Uh, this old uh, door stopper. So this is uh, maybe something to keep your table from hinging on. But I like these little spots in there. I think that'll create some spots. And I don't only have one of these, so I've got to place it down. But I think place it down in here. I don't want it to be isolated because it's unique, but I think that when I put this bubble wrap back in here, um, oh, I like, see how that's doing that? That's really cool. Put some of this up here. Whoa! Lay some of that down. See, that's why it takes a day to dry because I get it really soft and wet. When I put these bubble wraps back down, it's going to mimic that other round those other round forms there. So one, two, and three. If this were huge, I would maybe go five or seven. Um, let's see. Got an old toothbrush here. Get some atmospheric splattering. Get some splattering on the one I did yesterday while it dries. Add a little bit of that to there. All right. Maybe a little black splatters too. All right. Um, I love these, and I I really want this to uh, come out. So I'm going to add some more color Ooh, down here. And then put this down and I'll weight that down in a second one soak up some color on this one see what I'm doing here two and
paint with some wasp nests here. And the third, and I want to put that right in the middle. That will avoid the center. All right, and come back with a few circles, one big one, two, oh, and the other one was this little thing I'm using for a water container, and uh, three down here. Put some more color down where I want it. I'm going to soak up around these places. And voila! Now I will put some weights back on these things that need to be weighed down. Squish. And squish. And there we go. Maybe there. I will come back in a minute and uh, talk about transfer techniques. I gotta clean this up a little bit. All right, so after my paper is dry and I'm, and I'm uh, get set up and ready to draw, I've got my uh, drawing me media out, the ink and the charcoal and the graphite, and I'm ready to lay stuff out. Um, I, uh, there, there are a couple of ways to approach the drawing. I want to uh, give you some options here. One, of course, is to just take my my source material, and in this case the pollen, and just draw as uh, directly from it as we've been practicing throughout the semester, looking at the subtleties of the form and, and interpreting that onto the paper. The advantages to this is that I get to scale any of these uh, ob objects however I want to in this paper. I could do one uh, sort of photorealistic uh, uh, rendering of just this piece or that piece. I could make it huge and, and uh, get in and do the detail, or I could do a, you know 10 or 15 small ones in there, and that's up to you, however you want to approach it. But that would be uh, just a direct uh, drawn interpretation. Um, that allows for my interpretation, my subjectivity to come through, um, rather than a more uh, photorealist approach, uh, which I will show you now. So if I want to be more photorealistic about it, or even hyper-realistic about it, I could use, um, since I'm at home in my studio and don't have a projector, um, I could use a, a technique, and this has been uh, done for a very, very, very long time, where I take my uh, photo reference, and in this case, I've broken it down into one inch by one inch squares. So this is, say, I want this uh, little guy here, and I want to do a big uh, uh, interpretation of it, I just want one big plankton, and I, want, I really want to look closely at it, I can take this, each one of these one inch by one inch squares, and magnify them, like I've done here, into, in this case, two inch by two inch squares, or four inch by four inch, or one foot by one foot, so I'm taking each one of these squares and breaking it down, breaking this complicated form down, into smaller bits that are easier to see and tackle. One of the main uh, proponents of this style of working is an artist named Chuck Close. Uh, uh, you should look at Chuck Close's work. He's a hyper-realist. He does huge heads, like eight feet tall, faces that are uh, hyper-realist down to the pores and blemishes in people's skin. Um, and part of the reason why I did this uh, philosophically is because he has a condition called face blindness where it's very difficult for him to remember uh, people's faces, even the people who are closest to him. He also happens to be incredibly dyslexic like uh, a lot of us artists are. So he took his face blindness and made it the, the, uh, the point of his artistic study to do these big heads of his closest friends in order to, to study why that was. In any case, this is a great way to uh, increase or maybe even decrease scale. So I can take this little plank and I can make it huge uh, using this and break it down into manageable bits. You can also, though, have a lot of fun with this. And so I don't have to do a flat grid to a flat grid. 
in this space here, I've taken this sort of like a, like Star Wars, right? And I've, I'm pushing this force perspective. So I have a 3x5 grid here, I've got a 3x5 grid here, and I've got a 3x5 grid here, but this grid I've taken and put into a one-point perspective. So when I draw out that plankton, it is going to have this really big long tail, right? It's going to be this really big force perspective as it looks like it's shooting back into space. I can get even crazier with that with grids and uh, do a curved 5x5 five five grid. As long as I have the same number of squares, I can take and twist and morph this form. And that's a pretty fun thing to do as well. So that is uh, uh, technique number two for transferring your form onto your paper. Uh, technique number three would be where I use a, a transfer paper and basically uh, transfer this drawing onto the surface that I'm wanting to draw on. I'm gonna, it's easier to see on this white paper, so I'll use this. So let's say I want this plankton somewhere in that paper. I'm going to place it right here. Um, I could use some uh, commercially created uh, transfer paper. Um, here is some, so they make this in all, uh, well, they make it in white and black, but uh, white would be great on a colored paper if you, do, if you get a really colored surface. Um, I've got some graphite here, graphite, graphite paper um, that's black. And so um, I'm going to just, I would, if I'm being really, really, really careful, I'm going to tape that down so it doesn't move and shift. And I'll tape this down so it doesn't move and shift. But um, so now I just lay that down, follow the contours and the most important shapes and aspects of that form there, spend some time carefully doing that, lift that out, and then I have my contours of my form onto the surface. Now, I can't adjust scale here, so I'm stuck with the, the size that I have of this, this photocopy here, uh, or printout from a uh, laser printer. Um, so that's what you would need to do this, is, is a laser printer. Um, for the grid, I'm going to go back to that for a second. If you have Photoshop and you don't have a printer, but you have Photoshop, you can lay a grid over a photo reference and then transfer it onto a drawing that way. Um, if, I, if you don't have transfer paper, you can make your own transfer paper. Um, this is a, a piece of tracing paper, but it will work on regular paper, bond paper, printing paper, newsprint, and I've just... Uh, aggressively um, laid out some graphite from a, this is a, a graphite pencil, so I made that as dark as I can, and then when I draw over the top of that or transfer an image, I get that. Now, there's some advantage to making my own. First of all, I'm a cheapskate, so I'm not, I'm not spending any money on it. Second of all, this is easy to erase. So if I get it placed in the wrong spot or if I need, I don't want a line around my form right there, you can see this is harder to erase. So this commercially bought stuff uh, doesn't move around as easy, which I guess is an advantage. Um, I've made this red transfer paper from uh, some chalk pastels that I have laying around my studio and it works the same way. So I'm just going to pretend I'm transferring something there and I get the red, which might work great if, I'm, uh, if I've got a surface and I want some red introduced. I might come in with some uh, red color that way. So that's technique number three for um, getting your imagery onto your drawing, whatever way you choose to do it. I hope that you have fun. Um, I hope that this gives you an opportunity to create uh, something more intuitive and playful uh, and to use your skills and find your uh, way making this sort of uh, microcosmos um, at, as, you're, as you're at home in your own home studio. Um, email me uh, if you have any questions and uh, give me any feedback. Um, 
I think I've covered everything. Have fun and uh, take your time. Do a bunch of these. Enjoy the spring and uh, stay well.